So before I begin, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been asked to work on a project and your legs started shaking? You made up the best excuses you could think of why you definitely cannot do what they wanted you to do on this project. They asked you to give a time estimate for a really simple feature and you said, oh, I don't know, maybe two, three months. So are you scared of dragons? So I think any developer that has been, wor been working in the industry for a few years has run into such projects, especially if you worked in the bigger companies. So maybe not so much if you worked in a small startup because they only have small new projects, but when you work in a company that's big enough, that's been around, then you definitely run into such a project. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Dahlia, and I've been a server developer here at Twix for almost six years. And I've run into quite a few projects like that, both in previous uh, companies I worked for and the Twix. <laughs> uh, so for the last year, I've been working on rewriting, uh, I think one of our, the oldest ones we have here, uh, the Premium Services Project. And uh, today I would like to share with you some things I learned uh, from working on this project about rewriting old projects. So uh, I'll talk a bit about why we have those projects and when should we rewrite them and when sh we shouldn't. And then I'll try and go over some things you should think about if you want to rewrite a project and hopefully give you some tips uh, so that if you want to rewrite a project, you'll have uh, some ideas of where to start. So the quest first question we, ask we have to ask ourselves is why do we have a project and should we rewrite it? So uh, let me start by telling you our story. So once upon a time, in a land far, far away, we like to call Chashmonaim, three sorcerers decided to create a magical company, and they called it Wix. But no magical company can exist with no magical creatures, so they created some baby dragons. First they created an editor dragon, so since the company started as a flash, build, a flash website builder, they created an editor for creating flash websites, but then they actually wanted to make money. So they created the premium dragon, so they could actually sell subscriptions. And they all lived happily. But time went by, and new, new features were added, new projects were added, and any new, uh, uh, every new project that was added was created as his, his own unicorn service. And some of, the older, some of the older dragons were also rewritten to be nice shiny unicorn service. But only the premium was left as a dragon. And as more and more features were added to it, it grew and it grew. Oh, wait. It grew and it grew and it became too hard to handle. And so, the time has come to slay the dragon and free premium and make it a proper unicorn service. But wait, you say to me, we have many other dragons lying around Wix. Why don't we go and rewrite them all? Well, my friends, most of those are not dragons. They are dinosaurs, legacy dinosaurs. And we don't need to go slaying them. We put them on their own island we keep them fed, and every once in a while they give us some trouble, but we go and handle them. So why do we mix them? Well, I think the question we have to ask is what's common for both of them? And if I'll ask you that, probably the first word that pops to your mind is they're old. But being old isn't always bad. So wha what do we mean when we say they're old? Well, we usually mean they all use old technology We usually mean they use old technology, they're not tested properly, uh, their code is a big mess, and it's very hard uh, to work on them. So then what distinguishes them? What's the difference between them? Well, obviously, dragons breathe fire. 
but on a more serious note, I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, is the project alive? Now, a project is alive as long as there are still customers that are using it and are willing uh, to pay us money for it. But both those projects are still alive, so the qu the, this question isn't really accurate. So I think the more accurate question is, is it alive and still growing? So if the project isn't growing, if we're not adding any new features to the project, we're just maintaining the project, then it's a legacy project, and we should probably only keep it maintained. And if you have such projects, then I really recommend watching my talk about maintaining legacy projects. But I'm not going to talk about it today. So if, you have, if we have a project that is still growing, which means we're still adding new features to it, uh, then this project is alive, and we should really rewrite it. And uh, such a project is our premium services, and that's why we are rewriting the project. So now that we understood that we need to rewrite the project, the next question is, where do we start? Um, so the first step to start with is allocating resources. This is the most crucial part of the rewrite, and I think it's the, it's the point where most rewrites die. Why? Because it's easy enough for managers to agree that a certain project needs to be re rewritten. But, be, uh, but agreeing to give up resources to actually write the project uh, is a completely different story. Uh, especially if it's a big project. If it's a small project, it might be a month or two work, then it might be easier for managers. In our case, our estimate, and it's a rough estimate, we didn't actually write you know, a Gantt or a, We gave a rough estimate of two developers for two years. Now, giving up two developers for two years is a lot. Think about the amount of new features that two developers uh, can achieve if they are working on a project uh, for two years. So I think the thing to keep in mind, especially if you're trying to convince someone that you really need to rewrite a project, is that the time you're spending now is not wasted time. It's time that you're going to save in the future. Why? Well, first of all, your development velocity will increase dramatically. So adding new features to, the, to your system will become much faster. So if in the old system, adding any new feature is you know, a real problem, we don't, we're not sure what we're going to break, we're not sure how long it's going to take us, we don't completely understand the code, that adding features in the new system is going to be much faster, the system is built properly, it's much easier to add new tests to it, it's much easier to write new code to it. So that's, uh, that's the first advantage. The second one is that uh, you'll see that as you make the system easier, the product suddenly has a lot more opportunities. So if before the product would come and ask you to add a feature, and, and their answer you would give them is usually, oh, well, we don't know, we're not sure. So they only concentrated on adding the big features, because the small features, they knew that you know, there's no way anyone was going to do it. Then now, suddenly, you know, the answer can be, oh, that's an easy feature. We can do it in two days. This is an easy feature. I mean, there is no reason why small features should take so much time. So once you uh, create a new system, adding new features uh, can be much easier, and so it opens a lot of product opportunities. Also, once you rearrange the system in a way that more people understand, suddenly product can see things that maybe they didn't see before. And the last one, which is very important in my opinion, is that your ability to debug production uh, will increase them dramatically. So I think the old systems, uh, using old technologies, uh, makes it very hard to actually understand the problem when it happens on production. Also, if you decide uh, to divide a monolith to microservices like we do now, it makes it much easier uh, to understand which service the problem is on, and you can isolate it much faster. And also, you can recreate it much faster in your system because you have a proper uh, testing infrastructure, and you can just add a test and recreate a problem uh, from production. And the other thing uh, I would like to say about resource allocation 
is that a lot of times uh, we, we want to keep you know, our more experienced developers for, for working on new features, and maybe we'll give this task uh, for more junior developers. But I think it's important to put the more senior developers, or at least someone with experience uh, on this task that can see the system, uh, have a wider view, and, and use their experience uh, to actually make the rewrite successful. So once we decided we need a rewrite, now the question is, how are we going to do it? So if we're going to work on a system for two years, we can't write a new system for two years and then one day just go, OK, turn off the old system and let's turn on the new system. So it's not the way it works. So the show must go on. And so we have to have the two, both systems working in the same time. And then we'll have to move one floor at a time from the old system to the new system. So that, put, that puts a, an important constraint on our system because we have to make sure that the data is consistent between both systems. And there's a few ways to do it. Um, so you can write a shared DAOs or you can make the, the new system called the old system. But I think uh, the most trivial one, and this is the one we use, is uh, actually to share the database between both systems. Now you have to remember that if you share a database between two systems, then you cannot have any changes on your database while you're doing the, re uh, the rewrite. So uh, in our case, we really, really, really wanted to change the database uh, because it consisted from a lot of little tables because we really wanted to move to event source, uh, which is classical for premium events. Uh, but we just can't do it. So we, we, di we, we didn't leave the idea, we didn't give it up, but we just said we have to rewrite the code first, and once we're done with that, and we know the code is right and everything is tested, then we can do a phase two and go and change the database. And also, we don't want to find ourselves writing code twice. So we don't want to keep writing all new features in the old system. So all new features are going in the new system. And th that gives us uh, really two advantages. So the first one is that we're not writing the code twice. But the second one is that the dev velocity of new features is much faster now. Because they're already putting it in the new system, they're us using the new infrastructure, and it's much faster and it's a lot more fun for the developers to write the features in the new system than putting new features in the old one. So then we said we're going to move one flow at a time, but how do we know what our flows are? So if we have a little system, it's obvious, okay, this system does one, two, three. But if you have a big system, like we do, it's very hard to identify what the system does. So the first approach we took was, let's look at our monitoring system, which is New Relic at Wix, and see uh, what's the flows that are actually being used. Especially since we have a lot of code that is dead code, so we're not quite sure which APIs are being called and which aren't. So we checked in Relic and we found that we had 144 different API calls in a week. And also that the names of the API calls weren't always that uh, distinguishable. So because it was built layer and layer, it was very hard to understand from the names a lot of times what this API actually did. So we decided that's not the best approach. So instead, um, we decided to go and see what's the core business of the system. So for the premium, it's very easy. We say, okay, this is a, a system that sells a premium product. So our pre premium products are domains, packages, TPAs, mailboxes, and pictures. So we have products. And then for each product, we have uh, we have the flows that are being called. So we have a purchase flow, a management flow, notifications from the billing system, and back office flows for uh, the support. So we know what the core business is. So we said, let's start by implementing uh, the, flow, the, the core flows. And then once we'll be done with those, then we can go to the monitoring system and see what we forgot. And we're definitely going to forget. There are always little APIs that you Someone wrote for some system and nobody knows today who's using it. Uh, I can tell you we already found one little one for e-commerce and one little one for shout out. And I'm sure we're going to find uh, many more along the way. But it's a really good idea to start with the core and then see what's, what the little ones are around. 
And another thing to think about, and another thing to think about is look at the system at the limitations before you start your design. So a lot of systems don't have limitations, but uh, I think a lot of times when you look at the system that weren't rewritten, you'll find that it's because they had some kind of a big limitation that the system remained as it was for a long time. So in our case, our limitation was PCI. So PCI um, is a certification we have to get if we deal uh, with credit cards and it puts a lot of restrictions on our system. So our, in our old system, the whole system had PCI restrictions. And it gave us a lot of problems because we couldn't use any third party libraries that weren't approved for PCI. We couldn't use our framework. We couldn't have access, proper access uh, to our servers on production. We had limitations on our GA, et cetera, et cetera. And so the first thing we did before we even started planning the design was meeting uh, with Tomel from the security team. And he introduced us to, the, to Comsec, which is the company that gives us the PCI certification. And we asked what actually needs to be in the PCI. Where are we actually dealing in credit cards? And the answer was that only the purchase pages uh, actually have any kind of PCI restrictions on them because no other page actually deals with credit card. So this actually affected our design because we said, OK, let's take, let's take these, those pages, put them on a separate server. That server can have some PCI concerns, but nothing else should have this concern. So it can really affect your design if you think about your limitations first. So once we identify our flows, now what do we do? How do we start writing them? So we don't want to just copy code from one system to the other. So first of all, we want to understand what this code does, which is not always that simple, but it's a very important stage. And then we want to ask ourselves, does it make sense what this code does? So a lot of times we found that we had code that was never used. So it was added uh, with an experiment or something. It was never open. No one ever used it. So that code can be removed. We found code that was only written because of restrictions of the old system, but we might not need it uh, in the new system. So it's a really good opportunity to think about the flow and does it actually work the way it should work and, and decide uh, what should we keep and what should we remove. And then we don't start writing the code yet. Now we want to write tests. So the same as we usually do, where we, where we have a product description that we, we got from product, and then we are writing the tests, and then we are writing the code, we're going to do the same here. So we're going to write the test. We know what it's supposed to do. Now we're going to write the test, use it as a, our product description, write the test. So write one sunny day and to end test. And then for each, you know, if else you found in the code, go and write your unit tests. Have proper tests, and then you can go and copy your code and see that your test passed with the old code. And only once you did that, you can get to the most fun part, which is refactor. So now we can go and write it properly. We can change the libraries if we want. If maybe it's, it uses a really old library, and we want to use it in a newer library. And we can do all those changes, but at least we know that we didn't harm the basic functionality of the flow that we're copying. And then the last thing to think about is how you're going to actually move users from the old system to the new system. So if you're using an experiment system like we do here at Wix, you have to think where are you going to put the experiment. So a lot of flows are very, very simple. You have one system that's calling your old system, and you ju you'll just put an experiment and move that call to the new system. But then you might find places where it's much more complicated. So a good example is our purchase page. So the purchase page at Wix, the upgrade page, is being redirected from a lot of different places. So I only put four examples here, but there are many more. So you can upgrade from the editor. You can upgrade after you publish. You can upgrade from my account. You can even upgrade from the emails that we send to our user, the marketing emails. So we don't want to go to all those different places and start changing their codes so we can have an experiment in all those different places. Uh, so what we chose to do was actually put the experiment in the old system. 
And so all those prices are still redirecting to the old system, but the old system is redirecting to the new system. Now that causes a problem because we added a hop. So sometimes it's no problem at all, especially if you have like, a, if it's an offline a, a, a task, but a lot of times it's crucial. So you have to think about it and there's no do or don't do here. I think for each flow you're trying to move, you have to look at the pros and the cons and decide where the best place uh, to put your experiment is. And the other thing to do is test it in production. So although we're only changing the server, uh, we still want to make sure uh, that we didn't harm any functionality uh, that we had in the system before. So what we're doing is we're opening it in production and then we're running for the automation users and then we're running our full automation on production and making sure that, er the, that everything is covered, that we didn't harm any basic functionality. And only then we start opening, gradually opening our experiment for real users and obviously monitoring and making sure uh, that we didn't harm anything. Um, so that's it. It's not everything. You'll definitely run into a lot more things uh, if you try and rewrite, but it's, I think it's a, it's a base, it's a place to start from. And what should you do next? Well, you should grab your sword and shield, uh, have courage and patience, a lot of patience, and get going. And remember, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Good luck. Uh, so before I answer uh, any questions you have, I would just like to say that if you have a project that you want to rewrite, you want to think about it, you want some advice, I'll be really help, happy to help. Um, so I'll be around for uh, two and a half more months and then afterwards. Uh, but I'll be really happy to help. You can come and approach me. You can schedule a meeting with me. And if you have any questions now, yes. Yeah, so uh, the question is that if we're using the same databases for, two, two, for both systems, and then afterwards we want to move to event sourcing, then we're really doing another major rewrite. So is there a middle ground? So there, there are places, if we really, really wanted to do it, there are ways to do it. Um, I think basically by if you're separating the data out, and then you have both systems calling a a shared DAO or calling a shared uh, service that handles the data, then you can actually uh, do the data. Um, in our case, it was much more complicated because, and uh, don't be too shocked, uh, we actually had another service, service with, which is the back office, which was accessing our database directly. And so uh, we didn't actually want to start dealing with that, and that was the easiest solution for us for now. Uh, but there are other uh, possibilities to think about uh, if you want to do it. Yeah, okay, so the, uh, was the rewrite because of business logic changes or because of technical pain? So um, I think uh, the major problem here was technical pain. It became really, really hard adding new features. Uh, the premium is, is a very crucial part at Wix. Um, it's where we actually make money. And there are a lot of new features that we want to add uh, to the system, and it became very, very hard adding features to the system. It just, it, it was huge. Uh, I mean, I didn't go into technical details of the architecture, but we actually, up to now, we've already split our server to eight different microservices, and my guess is that by the time we'll be done, we'll have more than 10 different microservices. So it had a lot of concerns together, and it just became really, really, really hard uh, to add new features to it. So it was really a technical decision. I mean, it wasn't any... Yes, the back office was uh, reading from our system in the wrong way, but we could have opened uh, RPC services for it. But we. The first thing was it was beca became very hard to add features, and the second one was that it's really running on old technology. It's not, not using our framework, not using our framework, and also it's running on its own separate servers. It's not using our Nginx, it uses Apache, all kind of, a lot of different technical problems. So that was the major. Uh, we are, we're out of time. 
Um, so come later, I'll answer all your questions. <laughs>